was bit by the social entrepreneurship bug nearly 10 years ago. And since then, I've been involved in most aspects of social entrepreneurship education. I started as a student, like many of you, became a student leader, making change on campus. Then for the past five years, I've been at an organization called Ashoka, where I learned about social entrepreneurs, how they operate, what makes them tick, and how they got their start. Now, I lead Ashoka U, which partners with universities across the US and around the world to help support the growth of more social entrepreneurship programs. So my journey started to social entrepreneurship when I was a student. I, uh, I, like many of you, wanted to make a difference in the world and had no idea where to start. Uh, my college application was on how I would leave an indelible mark on society and how I would fight injustice. And I was coming to college to help figure out just how to do that. Um, so when I landed on Stanford's campus in September of 2001, um, the tech bubble had just burst, the Twin Towers had just fallen, and I was trying to figure out how I could actually achieve this big mission. My first week on campus, I was flipping through the course bulletin and found a course called Social Innovation and the Social Entrepreneur. I'd never heard those terms before, um, but they sounded intriguing, so I went to check it out. And from the very first time I heard a social entrepreneur speak, just as we've had the luck to do for the past hour, I fell in love. I was so inspired, and the, the passion and the integrity and the commitment of just what they were saying and who they were just completely resonated with me. And I knew then that that would be a life path for me. So from then, I, that particular speaker was trained as a doctor, Dr. Werner. He was American, but he was operating his organization in Mexico in a rural community. And what he found when he got there was that he was completely ill-equipped with his traditional training. He had to completely rethink about how he would do uh, his health education because he was dealing with an illiterate population. So he had to design the first ever book to teach and empower a, a wide population um, using pictures. And that, that approach has become so pervasive and widespread, it's now works in countries all over the world. But what inspired me was that as I heard more and more social entrepreneurs speak, he was a doctor, there's also lawyers, there are engineers, there are social workers, there's so many different pathways, and social entrepreneurship is just one way to think about having an even, even greater social impact. I saw young social entrepreneurs, older social entrepreneurs, wealthier and less wealthy, more and less well-educated. So it gave me hope that there was an opportunity for all of us to get involved regardless of their background. I then proceeded to get involved in every aspect of social entrepreneurship I could. I started taking classes in social entrepreneurship. I joined the student group. By the end of that year, I was leading the student group. I uh, helped organize the first conference on social entrepreneurship, and we also integrated uh, a social entrepreneurship track into the business school, uh, sorry, into the business plan competition. By the end of freshman year, I had lined up an internship for myself at Ashoka, a very prestigious organization for social entrepreneurship that operates all over the world. And that summer, I got to map out the state of social entrepreneurship education at universities across the US. By the end of college, I had been involved in almost, well, pretty much every social entrepreneurship activity and, and led many of them as well. And it just, what I'm most proud of when I look back is thinking about the student leaders that we, we created a network. Law students, School of Engineering, business school, undergrad, and together we aligned our strategies, thought about how we could work together collectively to build this into a cross-campus movement we also formed an advisory board on social entrepreneurship that had faculty and students. And one of the key outputs of that is that we designed, students designed, proposed, and got passed a minor in social innovation. So as I look back on that particular experience, and I can feel it here as well, it's just the energy of something new and exciting where you're empowered as a student to actually have input into that process I mean, I was graduating, but I knew that students after me would be benefiting for years to come from a lot of the activities that the co-leaders and I worked to build. So then I went to Ashoka. I've now been at Ashoka for five years, and that was just a very fertile learning ground to understand 
how do social entrepreneurs operate? Who are they? Are they born superhuman or do they, you know, do they have a developmental pathway? And what does that mean for when we work with universities and we want to share with earlier stage social entrepreneurs what, what they can do? So Ashoka, for those of you who don't know, is an organization operating in 70 countries that, that selects leading social entrepreneurs all over the world. There's now a network of over 2,500. And it also has a particular approach for how it finds and identifies these people. Unlike most funding organizations, it doesn't look at business plans or review grant proposals. It's, it's really taking a bet on people, very similar to how venture capitalists operate. So it's a very rigorous set of interviews and there's deep probing questions. Who are you? How, how do you embody your integrity? How do you identify this particular solution to be more effective than everything else out there? How are you going to mobilize people to work with you in your cause? How are you going to empower people in the process and not make them more dependent? How are you going to sustain yourself over time? And how do you address the root of the issue and not just the symptom? So all of these very big questions, but through thousands and thousands of interviews over the last 30 years, there's a few key insights, and one of which is actually quite refreshing. You know, what I learned is that they were not born out of the womb able to solve global poverty. This was something that they practiced over and over again. They often did have an experience when they were younger where they did something. It wasn't often very big, but they did something. And through doing that something and having a positive feedback loop and feeling inspired and feeling more confident, they started to do it over and over again. And over time, they took on bigger challenges, more sophisticated methodologies and approaches, and eventually they were helping to contribute to solving global poverty. Um, but for me, I started thinking of it as an analogy of just like going to the gym. It's really about a muscle that you're building up and it takes practice, it takes time, takes discipline, and you know, eventually over time you get much stronger at social change skills. So recently there has been some PhD research that actually corroborates a lot of these ideas as well, and it interestingly finds four key triggers in, in a kind of a sequence of pathways of how, looking back at certain Ashoka fellows, what were some of their formative experiences in their early schooling through college and in their early professions? And there was a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, predictable set of pathways. The first was they often had, the first thing was exposure to a social problem, whether it was international or in the US or local, um, just getting out there and seeing and experiencing and feeling a deep connection to um, a real need was what really prompted it. And that moved them to sort of some sort of commitment. And then it often took a role model to say, you can do it. Um, this is something that's worth your time, this is important, and you can do something big. Then it took getting actually to work in an industry, and for some it was being a teacher in a public school to get deep in understanding just what are the flaws in this system, and over time seeing, wow, I could do something better, I can improve this system, I can, I can do something about it. And then the fourth was having a group of support, a, whether it's peer support or mentors, because just as you're about to say, I can do it better, you can say, uh, I have absolutely no qualifications. I'm not trained. What am I thinking? So that's when having a peer group of support is extremely helpful to help you jump off that cliff. And so as I started thinking about all of these insights, I then thought, how can we apply this to a university context, which has so much potential to inspire and, and put more people on this path at scale? when they're really looking for some of these, these pathways. And so I lead Ashoka U, and I'm in the lucky position that I actually get to practice what I preach on a daily basis. We work with university presidents, professors, student leaders, um, and administrators to think about how can we develop and embed more social entrepreneurship programs on college campuses. Coursework, research, getting out there into the field, apprenticing with a social entrepreneur. And so we're able to bring in a lot of aspects of the Ashoka network, as well as Ashoka knowledge to, to work with campuses in doing this. And we now have a network you know, across the US, but also globally. And it's so exciting to see, you know, 10 years ago, I was getting started 
and it was so new. Now it's starting to spread like wildfire, and it's just a movement. It's, it's, the energy is palpable. And so I'll just give you one example. Tulane University, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, Scott, President Scott Cowan realized there was an opportunity to forge an identity for Tulane. So he instituted mandatory service learning hours for all freshmen, which was the first campus in, in the country that did that. And because of that, because of that getting out into the community, it not only built really strong bridges and ties and an understanding of what could be possible, it also attracted a whole set of students who wanted to come to Tulane because of that. Um, in the past few years, there's been an opportunity to build social entrepreneurship much more deeply into the fiber of Tulane. There's a special assistant to the president for social entrepreneurship. There are an increasing number of professors who see the value and importance in teaching and doing research in social entrepreneurship. There's even a new class that just got launched this year, designed by a student and co-taught by a student who is a young student social entrepreneur. Most recently, there's also a capital campaign for $100 million called Tulane Empowers. And it's, it's basically forming a grand vision for how a university can be an enabling environment for students to think about change making, building partnerships with the, with the community, and, and having the entire university make an impact. That's powerful. And so as I look back over my own trajectory, and I think about the theme, live innovation. It's possible to live innovation as a student. It's possible to live innovation as a young professional and throughout your entire career path. It's even possible for campuses to live innovation. So I encourage all of us to go out there to the gym, work our social change muscles, and don't wait to live innovation.